Lamentations chapter 4. So if you're looking for Lamentations, it's a couple of books right after the Psalms. If you hit Jeremiah, it is the next book in the Old Testament. Lamentations chapter 4. The text reads like this. How the gold has grown dim. How the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold. How they are regarded as earthen pots. The work of a potter's hand. Even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment and no hands were wrung for her. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones, and it has become dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger, who wasted away pierced, by lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of, of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean, people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes fail, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which we could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pit, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. You who dwell in the land of Uz, but to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sin. This is the word of the Lord. This reminds me of a story I think. I probably told this before years ago. When my children were little, uh, we went away for the week to Butlins. Smashing. Uh, and the great thing about Butlins in those days, is back in the 80s, was everything was free. But the bad thing was, it meant you had to go on everything. And one of the things we had to go on was this boating lake. And I wasn't very keen. I, I can't swim. I didn't fancy going out in this rickety little boat. But the family we'd gone with, they gone, so we had to go. So we eventually got down to the, the jetty and we climbed as a family, me and my wife and my three children, into the boat. 
And if you've had kids, you'll know that's a bit of negotiation, you know, who's sitting where, who's sitting next to who, and all that. And eventually we all sat down. I sat down, picked the oars up, put them into the oar thingies. <laughs> Technical term. And I <laughs> realized I was facing the wrong way. Got up, turned around, and that meant everyone else had to change spaces. You know, I can't sit next to them. So anyway, after about 10 minutes, we were still sitting by the jetty. And this red coat walked up. I said, hey, mate. You can use the whole lake if you want. I said, oh, thanks. I thought I had to stay just right here. By the I just, when you come to a passage like this, I think sometimes Christians need that, that, that encouragement. You can use the whole lake if you want. You don't just need to stick to the parts that are easy, the parts which we're familiar with. And I'm hoping as we look at this passage tonight, we'll learn something about ourselves. We'll learn something about God. We'll learn something about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and before we come to it, let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you, Father, it contains all we need to know to make us wise unto salvation. But once again, we confess that left to ourselves, we cannot gain from its study. So we pray that you would come by your spirit that you would come and illumine our dark minds and warm our cold hearts and bend our stubborn wills, that through the reading of your word, you would make us the people we ought to be. Speak to us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I watch a number of quizzes, probably too many on the telly, and there's one called Richard Osman's House of Games. I guess most of us will at least know of it or seen it. It's not the best. That's only connect. That's the best. But uh, <laughs> it is, it's, 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 you know, it's a harmless half hour watching it. And I remember one of, the, one of the parts of the quiz they have is a round called I'm Terrible at Dating. And what it is, is the, the host, Richard Osman, will give an event so he'll say something like, you know, the birth of Aristotle, or when were TV licenses introduced? Or, uh, completely random from anywhere. And then the four, four contestants have to write down when they think the year was. And, of course, you get some really strange answers. And I wonder if I was to try that tonight. I'm not going to ask you to shout out or put your hand up. But I think if I was to ask you, when did the Second World War begin? I think virtually everyone here would have the same answer in their head. 19. Exactly. Good. Phew. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's what I would have said, I must admit. But I listen to this history podcast. That's the kind of life in the fast lane I live. Uh, in this history podcast, they were talking about it, and they said, well, actually, a more correct year would be 1937. Why? Because that's when Japan invaded China. And that conflict went on all right through to, you know, to the Japanese were defeated in 1945. And when Japan invaded China, they swept across the land. They took Beijing, they took Shanghai, and they were marching towards Nanjing. You may not know Nanjing, but Nanjing at that time was the capital city. It was the place where the government sat. And as the Japanese army approached, the government got together and said, well, what we've got to do is we've got to run. We've got to run inland. You know, China's a big place. Let's go into the interior where they can't get us. We can't afford to lose the heads of the government. And they left one general in charge. And that general stayed in the city, and he looked, well, I guess, on the city walls, and he could see the Japanese army were going to get arrive the next day and he got in a boat and sailed down the Yangtze River away from the city leaving the city undefended some people say that that was because he thought by doing that that you know that the people would be shown mercy well if that's what he thought he got it wrong because the Japanese troops arrived in the city and it was December 1937 and the Japanese leaders said, 
do what you want. And what the Japanese troops wanted to do was to murder and to rape and to loot and to commit arson on a, on a grand scale. And over a period of six weeks, hundreds of thousands of people were murdered. It's known as the Massacre of Nanjing. And it was an awful situation. And it was caused by a failure of leadership. Failure on behalf of yeah, the Chinese who ran away, but also failure on the Japanese who didn't exercise any control at all over their men. And so this awful situation unfolded. Which brings us to Lamentations chapter 4 where we have exactly the same situation. An awful, a catastrophic situation that's been caused by a lack of leadership. Now, it could be argued that the whole of the Old Testament is all about a failure of leadership. We can go back to Genesis chapter 3. You know, if Adam had been the loving head he should have been, would Eve have been so easily fooled? Should he have left her alone? And like lots of leaders uh, after him, when he gets found out, he tries to pass the book. It was the woman that you gave me. Or what about Abraham? Here he is, this, the father of the faithful, boldly stepping out. And yet we see him telling lies to put his wife in danger to save his own skin. And then he has his son Isaac, and he does exactly the same thing. And then the next patriarch along is Jacob. And his 12 sons are going to be the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Surely he'll know how to lead his family. You know, he won't do anything foolish, like have a favorite son or give him a funny coat, nothing like that. No, of course he won't. Oh no, yes he will. Even Moses, arguably the greatest leader, I think Spurgeon said that the three greatest leaders that Israel had were Moses, David, and Gideon, strangely enough. But he's, he's a great leader. But even he didn't get into the promised land. And then we come to the judges. You know, they're marked out by their failure. And they get progressively worse as the book goes on. Until we end up with Samson. Who, if we did a SWOT analysis, well, his strengths are he's good in a fight. His weaknesses, well, everything else. He breaks all of his vows. And then we get the kings. Here's King David. What a great man, what a great leader. But he fails. And here's his son Solomon, and he has this glorious start. But he fails. And it's a litany of failure as you go through the kings. Yes, one or two do one or two things. You know, there's Asa and Josiah and Hezekiah. But most of them really aren't worth the carrot. Until we come to Zedekiah. And Zedekiah will not listen to Jeremiah, the man who's written this book. And in the final chapter of the book of Jeremiah, we read about Zedekiah. How the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, brings him out and lines his sons up in front of him and kills all his sons and then takes his eyes out. And Zedekiah would not listen to Jeremiah. And that final chapter gives the, gives the historical background to what we're looking at here in this book. So it's a reaction to a national tragedy. Jerusalem has fallen. The city has been taken. Well, I guess... As a kind of introduction, we can remind ourselves that Lamentations, the whole book, tells us it's not wrong to grieve. After all, the gospel is about how suffering people are saved by a suffering saviour. And to weep and to mourn is simply to live with eyes open and a heart alive in a world that's fallen. It reminds us that being a Christian isn't about having a big grin on your face and being happy, happy, happy all the time, time, time. Of course, we should also remember there are things that should make us joyful. 
that he has given us all things richly to enjoy, that he's given us every spiritual blessing, that he's given us forgiveness, he's given us peace. But there are things that should make us mourn. You know, I help out in our junior church, and last year we did a series on the Beatitudes, and we used this, uh, something called Faith in Kids, you may have heard of them, the children's organization, and they gave these sort of outline of a series to do on the Beatitudes, and each one has a little sort of drawing of a person sort of personifying the Beatitude that week. And so the first week we showed them all these and did them all, and then the second week it was my turn to, to lead, and I stood up and said, well, who can remember what we looked at last week? That's always a dangerous thing to do with kids, isn't it? But that's what, anyway, who can remember? And this boy put his hand up and said, we were looking at the Mr. Men. And actually, they do look a bit like the men, to be fair to him, but yeah. But no, we looked at Beatitudes. And what are the first two? The first is, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. The second is, blessed are those who mourn. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ, saying at the very start of the Christian life, there's this mourning. You know, in recent years, I've been reading a lot of a, an Australian writer by the name of John Woodhouse. He's an Old Testament scholar. If you've never read him, and you should, he's really good. <laughs> and he, he said this. He said, when we come to an Old Testament passage, there are three things we have to look at. First of all, there's the text itself. We have to pay attention to the details to bring out the richness of the Bible's message. But that's not all. We also have to look at the context. See where it sits in the book, where it sits in the whole continuing revelation of the Old Testament. But more than that, he said this, the proper purpose of biblical exposition is not simply to find relevant lessons for ourselves, but it's to proclaim Christ. And we're going to try and do all three of those as we look at these verses. And we're going to see these verses tell us about three things. Number one, they tell us about a desperate situation. Jerusalem has fallen, people have been killed, people have been taken into slavery. Number two, we're going to see they, they tell us about a definite source. Where has this calamity come from? And number three, we're going to be reminded that we're offered a divine solution. And this chapter has 22 verses, just like chapter 2 and chapter 1 and chapter 5. And chapter 3 has 66 verses. And the reason they're all divisible by 22 is because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And every chapter is an acrostic. So each verse begins with a different letter of the alphabet. Why has he done that? Well, some writers say he's trying to force order into a chaotic situation. And maybe that's right. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago when, when Queen Elizabeth died. There was lots of stuff in the, the press about it on, on the news. And one day at the end of the news, they had the poet laureate on. And he'd written a poem about the Queen. And he'd written it as an acrostic. But he hadn't used the Hebrew alphabet. He'd used the first letter of her name, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H. So each, each line began with one of those letters. And he'd only written two verses. And I remember thinking at the time, that's probably because there's a Z in there. <laughs> it's gonna be... So if you have zealous or zeal in the first verse, well, where are you going to go from there, you know? Zebras or zonal marking? I, I don't know where he went. But here, Jeremiah used an acrostic to force some sort of order into this terrible situation. So number one, we have a desperate situation. What's happened? Verse one, the temple has been destroyed. How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. You know, if there's one thing the temple didn't lack, it was gold. You go back to, to 1 Kings chapter 6, read about how Solomon built the temple. And it describes how it was being made. And everything, everything was covered in gold. Every surface. Then in 1 Kings chapter 7, 
He talks about all the, the, the furniture that was in the temple. And there's the altar, and there's a table, and there's tongs, and there's lamps, and lampstands, and cups, and basins. And they're all made of gold. Imagine what that must have looked like as you walked in. You know, you'd need sunglasses to go to church, wouldn't you? Look at this. But now, it's in ruins. All the, all the stuff that could be carried has been taken off to Babylon. And what's left has been covered in dust and debris and it's just lying strewn around the city. Now, that's sad that that's happened to that building. But you might say, well, it's only a building. And what's going to follow in this chapter is much worse. That's true. You know, but there's a symbolism here. There's a symbolism Think of like when the Twin Towers were attacked. There was, a, there was a symbolism about that. That these great sort of symbols of capitalism were hit. And God had promised, look, if you walk in my ways, if you obey me, then I'll dwell here with you. And it wasn't just the temple. It was the whole city. What does the psalmist say? It's beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion on the side of the north. The city of of the great king. Maybe that's why in verse 12 they were all saying, look, it can't happen here. But it has. The temple has been destroyed. I think secondly we see the desperate situation because of the totality of the people. It's clear that every part of society has been hit. So verse 2, there's the what he calls the precious sons of Zion. Who's that? Well, maybe it's royalty. Maybe, maybe he's referring to the priesthood. Yeah, but whoever it is, they've suffered. Verse 3 and 4, the infants will suffer. Verse 5, the rich will suffer. Verse 7 and 8, the nobility will suffer. Verse 10, mothers and babies. Verse 13 and 14, the prophets and the priests. Verse 20, the king himself. Everyone, young or old, rich or poor, no one is exempt. And he uses a series of terrible contrasts. So that the glory of the temple is now just rubbish in the streets. Those people who are worth their weight in gold, in verse 2, are now just like thrown away pottery, worthless, useless. Those who once feasted, in verse 5, are now suffering famine. Those who once wore purple are now living on a rubbish tip. You know, it struck me that the way he describes the rich here, it reminded me of the rich man and Lazarus. When, when Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus, the things he said about the rich man is he's clothed in purple and he feasted sumptuously. So this rich man is marked out by the way he dresses and the way he eats. And that's how these people are marked out here. Now, maybe that's not entirely true today. Maybe it's not what we eat or how we dress. You know, it's whether you do your big shop at Waitrose or, or wear designer gear, I don't know. Maybe it's other symbols that we use. But the point is that even those who had much now had nothing. You know, sometimes we hear politicians use the phrase, we're all in this together, and we all say, yeah, really? Well, these people really were all in it together. And verse 6, Jerusalem is compared with Sodom. And the verdict is, Jerusalem is worse. In verse 7 and 8, when he talks about the princes, he uses this very poetical language. You know, they're like snow or milk or coral or sapphire. And now verse 8, they're so ravaged by hunger that they, they're unrecognizable. And verse 9, it's entirely understandable that it's better to die by the Babylonian sword than this long, lingering, agonizing death that they were suffering. And then we have this verse 10, one of the most shocking verses in the Old Testament. That the hands of compassionate women, not Myra Hindley, not Rose West, but compassionate women have taken and boiled their own babies. What an awful situation this is. What a desperate situation. So what's the application of that to you and me? As terrible as it is. Well, I think there's one 
that are called modern and one that are called maybe it might sound old-fashioned, but I don't think it is. I think the modern one is that we must not allow ourselves to become desensitized to suffering. You know, a couple of years ago, I got a, uh, a turntable for my 60th birthday, which was great and terrible at the same time. It's great because I love playing records. I love, you know, my old music. But it's terrible because you've seen how expensive vinyl is. <laughs> it's like 40 quid. I can't believe how, how, how expensive they are. So I'm always trawling around second-hand shops looking for, for cheap ones. But thankfully, I've got a few old records that are kept. So I went up in the loft and brought them down. And one of the ones I brought down was by a group called Rush. And they've got this song on this LP called Turn the Page. And it's about how we, we sort of distance ourselves from trouble. And he says, we pretend things only happen to strangers. We've all got problems of our own. And then the chorus says, it's just the age. It's just the stage. We disengage. We turn the page. Maybe nowadays we'd say, we swipe the screen. We change the channel. It's just another famine. It's just another earthquake. It's just another war in some far off place. Or it's just another stabbing. Or just another shooting. Or it's just another terminal illness. Or just another tragic accident. I mean, John Blanchard's book, um, Does God Believe in Atheists? He, he talks about this time when Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, was being interviewed. And there'd been a, a, a minibus that had crashed and lots of people had died. And the interviewer was saying to Richard Dawkins, well, what do you, what's your view of this other thing? And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, so what? In a, a chaotic world, these things are going to happen. That's just the way it is. Which obviously is a terrible response. But how do we respond to suffering? Well, it's not an opportunity to score theological points, but surely it is a chance to show the compassion of Christ, to share the love of Christ. So I guess that's a sort of modernish one. And I call this one the old-fashioned one because I can remember this, this particular phrase being used well, when I was a young man, you know, listening to Bill Bygrove in, in, in Bridge Chapel. He definitely used this phrase at some stage or other. And it's this, sin pays dear wages. And that there's a day of wrath to come and no matter what people think, no matter what people say, even though everyone in the world, verse 12, will say, oh, this can't happen. It will. You know, there are plenty of modern equivalents of that. You know, I went to um, the Church of England school, St. Margaret's in Egbert, uh, grammar school for young gentlemen. And I remember when I, when I went there, even at the time, I thought it was quite old-fashioned. So every day we'd have an assembly and the deputy head would sit up on the stage with his black gowns on and he'd walk to the front and he'd say, gentlemen, rise. And we'd all go, mm, and stand up. And the headmaster would walk in, again, dressed in his black gown, you know, flown behind him. And, he'd come, and we'd have assembly. And usually, well, you, you don't listen to assembly, do you? Anyway, but usually it would be something that you weren't interested in. But I remember one day, we had this fella came in and talked about the return of Christ, which is a bit unusual in a Church of England setting, to be honest, a Church of England school anyway. Uh, and he ended the assembly by saying, if Jesus was, come, was to arrive tomorrow, what would you do? And so that was how he ended it. And we were walking out of assembly, and I walked past the teachers. And there was a group of them sitting there, and they, when I say teachers, these were the PE teachers, so, you know, not like... P in geography, not really proper ones. And they were, they were sitting talking to each other. And one of them said, well, what I'd do is I'd drop Steve Highway and move Ray Kennedy out to the wing. That's what I'd do if Jesus came again. And they were making sarcastic jokes. And it was all just a laughing matter. What does Peter say? 2 Peter 3. There will be scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? And because God is perfect, in his holiness and his justice, all sin must and will be punished. The only question is, where does that punishment fall? Which leads us to the second point 
which these verses tell us that there is a definite source. See, in one sense, what is happening here is God is is keeping his promise. He said, if you go your own way, then I'll leave you. And that's what's happened. And this chapter leaves us no wiggle room. There's no, no doubt. Verse 11 says, the Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. Was it Nebuchadnezzar and his might? Was it Babylon and all the power? Verse 16, the Lord himself has scattered them. See, no matter how bad things are, God is still in control of all things. Not just the good stuff. You know, in the Islamic faith, they have something called kismet. I used to think that was Miss Piggy's boyfriend, but it's not. Kismet is, I think it was that one. Kismet is, uh, means faith. So they believe, it. you know, here's Allah who's all controlled, but he's not in control of everything. If something bad goes, well, that's kismet. That's just the way it is. But the Bible teaches us that God is absolutely sovereign. And the fact that we have food and shelter and peace and freedom, of course we should give thanks for that. But if we lose those things, it doesn't mean he's lost control. And in one sense, these people were guilty and were getting their just deserts. But in a particular sense, the finger of accusation, as I said at the beginning, is pointed at the leaders. Verse 13. For the sins of the prophets, for the iniquities of her priests. You know, you read Jeremiah, and he's a lone voice for the truth. And all the rest of the religious establishments at that time were men pleasers. They just told the people what they wanted to hear. Verse 20, where it talks about the, the king himself, the Lord's anointed. How did he try to solve the problem? He went to Egypt of all the places to go. And the three offices that they had in Judah were, were meant to be like a check and a balance. So they had, a, they had prophets, they had priests, and the kings. And the point was, if one went wrong, the others would, would set them right. So when King David goes off the rails, what happens? The prophet Nathan comes along and sets him straight. Or later on, when the, when the law is forgotten and the priests aren't doing what they should, what happens? The king comes along, King Josiah, and rediscovers the law. So what had gone wrong? Well, at the end of Jeremiah chapter 5, it says this. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their direction. And my people love to have it so. In other words, that the prophets were just saying what they wanted to hear, and the priests were happy to go along with it, and the people were like, this is great. We can all live together in blissful ignorance, because what could possibly go wrong? And the end of that verse, uh, verse 31, I think it is, Jeremiah, it says this, but what will you do when the end comes? You're very happy now, but what will you do when the end comes? And that's what he asks in this uh, chapter, in verse 18. The end of verse 18, our, our end drew near, our days were numbered, for our end had come. See, at their best, The prophets and the priests and the kings of the Old Testament foreshadowed Christ's coming. And at their worst, they showed why his coming was necessary. So the root cause here of this this, this catastrophe is it's God's judgment against the sins of the leaders. Now you'll be sitting there tonight and thinking, well, phew, that's a relief. That gets us off the hook, doesn't it? You know, I'm not a leader. I can sit back. I can relax. It's easy to criticize leaders. We all like to do it. I can remember 30 years ago now being in the house and there was a knock on the door and it was a fella doing a a Gallup opinion poll. Okay. I guess they all do it online nowadays, but this is a fella actually knocking on asking questions. And the first, very first question he has he asked was, Do you think the government is doing a good job? And I think there should have been three boxes that said, no, definitely not. And you're joking, aren't you? But it, it wasn't. No, it, was, it didn't say that. But I think whatever your political persuasion, people never think the government's doing a good job. 
We always like to criticise our leaders. And every sports fan likes to complain about the manager. He's getting it wrong. And everyone who works likes to complain about the boss. We all like to complain about our leaders. So we let off the hook saying, well, look, this is the leaders who are wrong. Well, can I give you, give you a general principle? That if when you're reading the Bible, you come to a passage and you think, well, that's taught me where other people are going wrong. You probably missed the point. So it's not about other people, it's about you and me. And you might say, well, I'm not a prophet. Well, in a biblical sense, that's right, you're not. But there are people who, if they don't hear the word of God from you, they won't hear it from anyone. But I'm not a priest. We don't have priests. Of course we don't. We don't need a mediator. We don't need someone to offer a sacrifice. That's all been done by Christ. But we all have friends and family and neighbours who we need to bring to the throne of grace. Well, I'm not a king. Well, a king is just simply somebody that people will follow. You know, there's lots of things in modern life which uh, get on my nerves. <laughs> Maybe it's a thing for getting old, I don't know. <laughs> but the one that really gets me goes the most is when people say, my career, my job, I'm a TikTok influencer. <laughs> you are. Uh, well, if, if you're young today and you think that's a, an ideal career, can I tell you it's not? Uh, <laughs> but there is a sense in which we are all influencers. We're all leaders. Because people look at us and will judge us by, by the way we behave. So if that's the case, have you told everyone you should the good news of the gospel? Have you prayed for everyone you should? Have you always set the good example that you should? Can I answer for you? No. And neither have I, and neither has anyone at all. And we're all as deserving of condemnation as these leaders in this city. Which is why, thirdly and lastly, we have to see a divine solution and the failure of leadership is answered in christ and christ holds three offices of prophet priest and king he's a prophet because he's revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of god for our salvation he's a priest because he's once offering himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and to reconcile us to god He's a king subduing us to himself, ruling and defending us and restraining and conquering all of our enemies, not simply the petty enemies we have in this world, but the great enemies of sin and death and hell that he has conquered by his death and his resurrection. So how can the failure of leadership be answered in Christ? Because the justice of God is satisfied in him. In verse 22, it says, the punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished, finished. How can that be the case? That can be the case because in verse 11, the Lord gave full vent to his wrath. And the last couple of verses of this chapter introduce us to the daughter of Edom. And the Edomites are basically the, the ultimate noisy neighbours you know, they're descended from Esau. You think they'd be friendly, but they're not. They're always hostile to the people of God. And here, they're pointing the finger and they're, they're made up at what's happened to Jerusalem. And Jeremiah basically says to them, laugh all you want, but you're next. You know, everyone enjoys the tables being turned. You know, bullies getting the hiccup up. And here, the Edomites are loving it. They're reveling in this trouble. And he says, hold on, Zion's punishment is done. And one day the exile they're in now will be over. But for you Edomites, there's no one to cover you. You'll be exposed, you'll be punished. So the closing question is, how does this divine solution work? Well, in a sin-sick world, you don't think or talk 
or live as you should. And neither do I, and neither does anyone else. And we all deserve punishment just as much as the Edomites, just as much as the city of Jerusalem. After all, Jerusalem, what we're told in verse 6, was more guilty than Sodom. Why? Because they had more light. How much more have we had than the people of Jerusalem? So how can we have any hope? Well, because what described in verse 11 that's happening to Jerusalem is also describing what happened at the cross. When the Lord gave full vent to his wrath, he poured out his hot anger. And verse, the first half of 22 is the position of any believer. The punishment of your iniquity is accomplished. It's been done. And then we're going to close in a moment with a, a hymn. And one of the lines in the hymn says, The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And here's this obscure passage in the Old Testament. A part of the light maybe we don't visit very often. But it's pointing us to the great central theme of the gospel. That of substitutionary atonement. As another hymn writer puts it, In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Or maybe even better, as the Apostle Paul puts it, in 2 Corinthians 5, He made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's where our hope lies. And that's why we sing in our final hymn, To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>